Hello and welcome to this NDTV exclusive. My guest today is someone described as a rock star economist whose book Capital was a worldwide sensation, triggering a widespread debate on inequality, the widening gap between rich and poor. Thomas Piketty used new data to suggest that even in developed countries, wealth creation does not necessarily reduce inequality, but it actually exacerbates it, setting off a fierce debate. We'll get a chance to ask him about whether since the book come out, inequality has worsened or improved. What are the ways to level the playing field? And what are the implications for a country like India? Thomas Piketty, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us. Thank you. Now, I want to ask you, it's been about uh, two years since the book came out, since Capital came out, and it shook up the entire world on this debate of inequality. But today, as we speak, uh, as you know, the Davos summit is going on, and to coincide with that, Oxfam, which is this global advocacy, always releases new data on inequality. And they actually suggest that things have gotten worse. They say that now only 62 individuals, wealthy individuals, own as much as the bottom half of the world. In 2010, that was 388 individuals. You could fit them on a plane. Now it's just down to 62. You can probably fit them onto a double-decker uh, bus. Are you surprised or disappointed that things have gotten worse, or this is inevitable? No, I don't think this is inevitable, and I don't think this is necessary. You know, I think extreme inequality of the kind we see today is, is not, it's actually not good for growth. You know, I mm. think if we want to have sustainable uh, uh, development in the long run, uh, particularly in a country like India, I think we, we need to reduce inequality. I think when you have this kind of extreme level of inequality, yes. first, this is bad for the working of our democratic institution, because this can give excessive influence of a small group of individuals in the financing of political parties, the medias, and also from a purely economic viewpoint, it's not good because you, you want broader groups in the population to be able to access uh, All skills, the various services. And, and that's, that's very I, important. I want to ask you about the impact of inequality, but first I want to understand the symptoms of it, which you outline in your book, because for those who might just be coming in uh, to this discussion, and I'm very, very oversimplifying here, so please uh, uh, excuse me, but basically what you do by looking at decades and decades of income tax data, uh, particularly of wealthy countries, is that you find that wealth creation has not necessarily reduced inequality. It's actually exacerbated it to the point where you actually need governments to come in and level the playing field. Why has that been the case? Why has the rising tide not lifted all boats as it was meant to? Well, the, probably the main reason is that market forces in themselves you know, are good to produce new wealth, but it would be a mistake to believe that these natural forces are enough to keep the distribution under control. So the main lesson from historical experience, and mm. what's really new about this book is that we have been putting together a lot of historical data, and probably yes. the main lesson is that we need strong uh, democratic, uh, fiscal, uh, social institution in order to put this powerful uh, market forces uh, in, in the common interest. So what we see, for instance, in the 20th century yes. is that it is only after uh, World War I, World War II and the new social and fiscal reforms that are put in place uh, in developed countries in the post-war era that we have a more balanced distribution of income and wealth as well as more sustainable growth. Now, since the 1980s, 1990s, We've entered into a new era of uh, excessive financial deregulation. I mean, market competition is not bad in itself, but yes. you want to keep it under control. If you have excessive deregulation, uh, then this is not too good. That's an important point because the super rich, or at least those who believe in, in, free, in the free markets, will turn around and say, look, the rich are getting rich because of their hard work, because of the fact that the globalized economy is growing. So what's the problem with that? But what you're saying is that it's not just as simple as saying that it's a meritocracy you're saying the system is working for the rich. Right, you know, if you, if you look at uh, data for the US on access to higher education, what you find is that, you know, people with parental income in the bottom 20 or 30 percent, you know, they never go to university, their chance to make it is less than 20 percent. And people in the top 10 percent, 90 percent of them go to university. So, you know, this doesn't look too much like meritocracy to me. So I think it's important to put this kind of claims about meritocracy under public scrutiny. Right. So it's, you it's, actually call this patrimonial capitalism. It's yeah. It's if you when have it stays within the family. 
In the family or if the newcomers, uh, uh, because you always have some newcomers, you always have some mobility. You know, the rich of today uh, in the world are not the same as the rich of 20 years ago. But the speed at which uh, the average wealth of this group has been rising is just not compatible uh, with the growth of the size of the total world economy. You know, let, let me put this very clear. It's not a problem at all to have uh, uh, people who are billionaires, people who are in the middle, people who are poor. Right. As long as everybody goes up together more or less at the same speed. Now, the problem is that this is not what's happening. If you look at any uh, ranking of billionaires published by Forbes or other magazines, yes. what you find is that the top wealth group have been rising at 6, 7, 8, 9 percent per year, which is two, three, four times faster than the size of the world economy. Mm. So I think everybody can understand that this cannot continue forever because you don't want in the long run, if that was to continue forever, the, the share of world wealth belonging to billionaires will go toward 100 percent, which everybody would argue would be excessive. So this has to stop somewhere. I'm not saying it will go to 100 percent. It will stop below that. But where exactly will it stop? Nobody knows. So I think that's why we need more transparency. Okay. And, and that's missing in many countries, particularly in India. What's a, you think a, a realistic or a reasonable tax rate that the rich should be paying, let's say in a country like America or in the West, compared to what they're paying now? Again, we start from a situation where the, the system is typically regressive in the sense that the effective tax rate people pay at the top tend to be less than at the bottom. So it needs to be put progressive. How far do we need to go? We, you know, it's difficult to have a quiet discussion about mm -hmm. taxation. Yes. People get very excited very yes. fast. Let yes. me simply yes. say this. In the United States of America, between 1930 and 1980, so during half a century, on average, uh, the top income tax rate applying above $1 million in, in annual income was 82% on average. Okay. Since Reagan, it has been reduced to 30, 40 percent. Now, the evidence is that if anything, productivity growth was higher back in the 50s, 60s, 70s than it has been since the, the Reagan data years. shows this. Well, yes, the productivity growth of the US economy since 1980 you know, has been 1.5 percent per year in per capita term, whereas it was you know, 3 percent per year in the 50s, 60s, okay, because 70s. Because that turns the whole argument on the head against those who say that, look, if you increase taxes, then growth will slow down. Yes. So at the very least, you know, we should look at this experience again and think, think harder about this. Now, income taxation is one thing. Another issue uh, is, is wealth taxation, you know, because many people may have uh, uh, huge wealth but n do not necessarily show up with very high incomes, for instance, because the return to their assets goes to, uh, to, uh, to family holdings or different uh, vehicles. So, that, so, that yeah. the, so I think it's important to, to look at, uh, at taxation as, as a fraction of income, as a fraction of wealth. Are you, you're now a, a probably a millionaire yourself or close to it. Uh, what sort of tax do you pay? Well, you know, on my copyrights, I will, I will, I will pay in France, uh, you know, 60, 70 percent tax. And, I, you know, I would like to pay 80, 90 percent. You know, look, I have enough with my uh, wage as, a, as an academic professor. I am already very privileged, uh, you know, as a university professor. Yes. And let me also stress that, you know, when someone like me get, gets extra income through copyright, you know, it's because I have benefited from a free education system which allowed me to you know go to uh, university and and, and, right. and in the end write books and you know it's the same for everybody you know when when so you uh, don't have a problem with that level of taxation no, look, you're happy to give back you know wh when you invent a computer when when an entrepreneur says well you know i have invented windows I, well okay except that you have a lot of public research in computer science that was subsidized by public money which allowed smart entrepreneurs to build on that in order. So, you know, we, the idea that we are just individually uh, responsible for our income, I think, uh, is an illusion. You know, we all live in a system where without all this public infrastructure, mm. uh, it's all not going to be you know, this, this is not going to happen. But, you know, when you propose in your book that one of the solutions is to have this global tax, uh, which will be across the board, which will prevent, in a way, the fact that capital can flow here and there and hide. Uh, is that realistic? Because many people say, how is that actually going to work? Who will be the, this universal tax inspector that's going to impose it? How will revenues get distributed? It's just a plan that's not going to work. Okay, two things. First, we can make a lot of progress in terms of international cooperation. You know, I'm, I am absolutely convinced about this. Look, a few years ago, everybody say, was saying that bank secrecy in Switzerland will be with us forever. And it just took a few U.S. sanctions against Swiss banks for the Swiss government to change their law. So sure. the view that we cannot change is that there's nothing we can do, that tax havens are too strong for us, you know, I think is crazy. There's a lot we can do. 
Next, there's also a lot that can be done at the national level. You know, okay. the fact that there's competition between countries uh, doesn't mean that we should have a regressive tax system, uh, you know, in India or, or in France. You know, look, if you look at the taxation of uh, inherited wealth, uh, you look at the US, you look at Britain, you look at Germany, you look at Japan, you always have a uh, very substantial taxation on large inherited wealth of the order of 30, 40, 50 percent. Uh, now, there are some countries like, 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 like India where it's uh, zero percent. You mm. know, is this the only solution? Again, the evidence, if you look at different countries oh, in so the you world... you say there's still scope for a lot of maneuver. Of course, of course. When you see a section of the super-rich who are now actually giving their money away, the Warren Buffett, Bill Gates form of corporate philanthropy, is that a form of reducing inequality or are you not convinced by that? You know, I'm not entirely convinced. I think, uh, you know, private philanthropy can be useful if it comes uh, in addition to taxation. But if it comes instead of taxation, I think it's not enough because you cannot organize a society with thousands of people who decide for themselves how much they want to contribute to the public good. So if it's in addition to taxation, it's fine. But otherwise, you know, some people will do useful things with their money. Some people will use it to influence the political process. So in the US, you have a lot of private money right. into political movement. Uh, you you know, is this, uh, uh, you know, is this doing any good? You know, this is not clear. So, so we need to have a clear tax system where everybody is contributing to the, to the, you know, public, uh, public good, and, and then in addition, uh, you know, philanthropy can be fine. If they want to give it up. Here's another thing people say. They say that look, inequality may be growing, but at net levels, poverty is falling the world over. So, what's the problem? The fact no. is that the boats are being mm -hmm. lifted. The, the problem is just that we could do even better. You know, we could lift poverty faster. Uh, we could have more uh, uh, inclusive growth uh, in India, in China. So the fact that emerging countries are doing well and that poverty is, is being reduced is, is great news. But we could do even better. And I think that if we want to have sustainable growth uh, in the long run in countries like China and India, uh, we need to have a more inclusive growth, a uh, more transparent tax system. Otherwise, again, it's very difficult to build a trust uh, in taxation, in public spending, in government, in public education, public health system, uh, if, if you don't have uh, more fairness and fiscal justice in the, in, the, in the system. So this historically building up a more progressive and including fiscal and social system has come together uh, with, uh, with uh, sustainable growth and, and I think it will be the same in so the future.